Next, we have Dr. Sarah Winter, is a clinical psychologist based in Brisbane with over 15 years experience and a special interest in sleep disorders and chronic disease. Sarah is experienced in working with people from, with sleep disorders, depression, anxiety, trauma, grief and loss, and the psychology contaminants, is it? What is it? <laughs> Cominence, sorry, <laughs> of chronic disease and chronic pain. Sarah has extensive experience and a special interest in the psychological aspects of the management of sleep disorders, including insomnia, hypersomnolence condition, circadian rhythm, sleep wake disorders, obstructive sleep apnea, parasomnias, and nightmares. Please welcome Sarah. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I'm pleased I'm the last speaker actually because I want to make sure this is a really useful practical session so it means I can make sure I'm not repeating a lot of the themes that have already been covered. And also thank you to Michelle and Fiona for your talks. I found them really moving. Um, so some of the things that I wanted to talk to you about today is and I guess the things that I would cover with people who come and see me is to start off with some education about hypersomnia. That's pretty, pretty commonly the case that I will see someone with narcolepsy or IH and that's about all they know about it, that they've got this diagnosis. So, you know, that, of course that varies, but, you know, sometimes part of the treatment plan for me is actually education about what these conditions are. Also talking about what are some effective coping strategies for dealing with this and um, you know, strategies uh, generally for when you're persistently sleepy. What I base my treatment on is CBTH, which actually comes from Jason Ong's group in the United States. Jason Ong also does a lot of research on insomnia and uh, mindfulness. So this is sort of the structure of the program that I've developed over time and I wanted to take you through um, a lot of the aspects of this. But I'm very keen to get your feedback on this too, you know, what things that you find useful and is there, if there's anything you think's missing as well. Uh, you know, what, what would you uh, recommend to a clinical psychologist like me about what, what we need to cover and what's useful? But we'd be looking at cognitive, behavioural, interpersonal and mindfulness and acceptance-based principles throughout. So today I've pitched this talk uh, specifically around the central disorders of hypersomnolence. So I guess as we've learned today, there's lots of different reasons why people might be sleepy. And there's a lot of comorbidity uh, with people who have narcolepsy or IH with other psychological or medical conditions. So I guess what I hope is that the things that I talk about might be useful, I guess, regardless of, you know, the cause of the sleepiness or, you know, if there's other factors involved as well. Something that I'd be, you know, I think is important for us to talk about and perhaps something during the panel discussion that we can um, discuss if it's useful too is how identity changes with, you know, these conditions and with this diagnosis that, uh, you know, there's a lot of grief and loss around the changes that occur in terms of your functioning with these conditions. And I, a common thing that I will see is that people often are very high achieving prior to diagnosis. So the kind of people that have burned the candle at both ends, really highly functioning. And how do we adjust? to changes in life that comes from energy now being a really precious and limited resource. And there's something that, you know, Fiona and Michelle were both talking about is this sort of acceptance-based process and something that is a key feature in psychological support and intervention as well. Acceptance doesn't mean liking it or wanting it. So I guess acceptance of the reality of the circumstance means we've got choices about what direction we head from there. I guess the other option is to refuse the reality of the circumstance, but often that means we continue to act in ways that aren't in our best interests. 
potentially, or we keep hitting our heads against a, a brick wall. So I guess ideally we're thinking about what path we want to go down here in terms of effectively managing as best we can, even if we don't like it. Uh, some of the research around quality of life impacts, but of course, you know, this is something that you all know. The, you know, I, I probably don't need to go much into, into this and not much of this would surprise you, I'm sure. The common things that I would see is a really high comorbidity with things like depression and anxiety and other psychological difficulties in addition in addition to having narcolepsy or IH, and those are things to be considered as part of treatment. Um, and broadly speaking, things around relationships and quality of life, work, study. In my clinical practice, common things that I'll see, even though it's not necessarily always documented in the literature, would be that um, people with IH in particular um, often don't respond as well to medication or it's, or it's sort of, uh, you know, more, more variable in the response, although that's certainly the case in narcolepsy as well. Um, there can be stigma around this idea of an idiopathic condition. So, you know, uh, what does that mean <laughs> when there's no clear, um, you know, cause that they can put their finger on? There tends to be a very long time with lots of symptoms but without clear diagnosis. And that adds a lot of additional opportunity for misdiagnosis and, um, and uncertainty, which is very uncomfortable psychologically. It can be hard to navigate community support. So for instance, things like NDIS or um, pensions or um, insurance through work. And as I said, there's lots of comorbidity Often um, there's narcolepsy or IH in addition to lots of other things going on as well. So it's quite complicated. Some useful resources and websites that I might point people to if they want to do some of their own kind of looking around and um, having supports. I get, what I hope is that all of you have sort of navigated this a little bit as well and found some community-based supports if that's useful to you. But I think sometimes it's useful to have a few kind of, you know, ports of call to begin with. Now, in terms of the actual components of the things that I would work with people with, we, we would look at sleep, certainly, but I think it's important to recognise that with a central disorder of hypersomnolence, a way to think about sleep is that it's inefficient. So, you know, we could sleep and sleep and sleep all day long and still be sleepy and still having these effects. So what we do is look at trying to get the best we can out of the sleep and perhaps looking at some of the structures around sleep, but that ultimately more, much more of the intervention is focused on daytime and how do we manage energy? How do we get through you know, the day as effectively as possible? So around sleep, what we want to do is have a look at a sleep window that I guess gives us the best opportunity for the best quality sleep we can manage. Uh, but we, what we don't want to do is sacrifice quantity for quality. So what I mean by that is that it's not unusual that people come and see me and there's actually an insomnia element going on as, as well around their sleep. Because in addition to being sleepy, potentially also very fatigued and exhausted and needing rest. Uh, and the challenge can be sometimes if we're needing rest, but not more actual sleep, it adds more opportunity to be in bed wakeful. So insomnia can creep in. So it's a fine balance and it's very individual and different for everyone, but we're just experimenting with what's a window that fairly reliably gives you your quantity for sleep, but uh, isn't sacrificing quality. We want to experiment with napping and not everyone benefits from napping. So just like medication, psychologically, a lot of the things that we work on is a bit of an experiment, doing some pre post experiments to find what's most useful for you. Uh, but many people do find napping useful and often brief, frequent naps can be 
of you. So again, we'd experiment with that. So what we'd look at is, you know, generally speaking, what's a sleep window potentially with some napping and, you know, how do we get the best bang for our buck out of sleep as we can, given that we've got a high performance condition. Now, of course, all the general sleep hygiene stuff counts, and usually these are things that each people in the general population know. So I know there's nothing sort of revolutionary there. But something I do find, and I guess, you know, when we talk about that sort of path towards acceptance, often people with a central disorder of hypersomnolence will have to be a little bit more strict on some of these sleep hygiene aspects of things, which isn't fair. So, you know, that that's um, tough, but, but that can be part of it as well, is, you know, as, as best we can, knowing that life happens and that we have to be flexible, just thinking about things like managing caffeine during the day and alcohol use, um, trying to get some you know, gentle, moderate physical activity in, in the day and so on. So again, we're just trying to get the best we can out of the sleep quality. And on this, this idea of acceptance, I like the metaphor of the Chinese finger trap. So I'm not sure how many of you have sort of come across a Chinese finger trap before, but I think it's a nice metaphor for this idea that so with a Chinese finger trap, you put your finger in each end and of course your natural urge is to pull against it to try and get back out of it. The trouble is the way the bamboo's woven, the harder you pull, the tighter it's going to grip you. The only way out of a Chinese finger trap is actually to push into it. And as you push in, it loosens and it kind of drops off the end. So any strategies that we put in place around, you know, managing uh, hypersomnolence will be kind of with this attitude of acceptance and going with, which again doesn't mean liking it or wanting it. But, you know, based on the reality of your circumstances and the diagnosis and based on the reality of your day today. So today might be a better day than it was yesterday and so on. So from that standpoint, what choices do I make to have the best life I can? SMART goals can be a really useful acronym to, you know, think about how we manage, you know, day-to-day -day choices. So if you're the kind of person who prior to diagnosis would burn the candle at both ends, you know, just do everything for every, everyone all the time, uh, it can, that can be a very difficult thing to adjust to as to how do I reevaluate my goals and choices each day. So SMART is just an acronym for trying to have really specific goals. We want them to be measurable, so how do you know that you're successful? Importantly, we want them to be achievable and attainable, and, and that's sort of something that has to um, be adjusted in the context of your condition, but also day to day. You know, what's, what's attainable today? Relevant, I think this is something that's really important to consider, that you know, it, when we've got an unlimited resource, got lots of energy, perhaps we can sort of, you know, have our fingers in lots of different pies. But when energy is a precious and limited resource, you've got to prioritise about what's most relevant, what's of higher value, what's of most importance to you. So you're making choices about where you're going to divulge that energy. And time-based. Again, we want it to be sort of achievable and in a time frame. And I'll actually go into that in a little bit more detail in terms of the practical strategies. So ideally, we're setting SMART goals. So, so far, some take-home messages. We want to be able to focus on who we are now compared to perhaps who we want to be, ideally, versus who we were in the past. We want to think about how can we get the best out of our sleep and our sleep environment, knowing that the reality is that sleep is inefficient. So we're kind of doing, doing the best and doing some exper experimentation around a sleep window, but, but ultimately we spend much more time than thinking about what does the day look like. The Pomodoro technique can be really useful to think about uh, in terms of, you know, in a SMART goal, when I was saying time-based as well. So Pomodoro is a tomato. So if you think about slicing up a tomato, essentially what we want to do is slice up the day into smaller portions. 
It's similar to the spoons theory, but with some tweaks to it. So there's no right or wrong about how you would slice your day up. You might slice it into sort of half an hour segments up to you know, a couple of hours. It just depends on what's most useful for you. So I guess the most common way people would slice up their tomato would be maybe a waking period, maybe a, a morning period, then maybe a pre-lunch period, an after-lunch period, early afternoon, late afternoon, evening, and et cetera. So you're kind of segmenting the day. And then the idea is to think about strategically how you're going to use each of those segments based on what's most important and based on how your energy is fluctuating during that segment, based on you know, what's important, your responsibilities and so on. But perhaps something to have a think about is if you were to employ this Pomodoro technique, how might you slice up your day? And the idea then is you've got sort of a goal for each segment of the day rather than thinking about how am I going to get through an entire day. Something else that we would be thinking about is this balance of what we call nurturing and depleting activities. So if this dotted line kind of represents sort of your baseline, oh, it's not, anyway, I'm pointing at the dotted line. So that's sort of, you know, your baseline energy. So for some people, you know, your baseline might be kind of persistently low. So kind of recognising what does that look like for you rather than what does that look like for you compared to the next person. So we're sort of individually, what does that baseline look like? But there's times where if we look at the squiggly line, this is sort of how the energy might fluctuate during the day. It's going to look individual for you, sort of just an example representation. But let's say your energy is lower on waking, you've got a period of sleep inertia, for instance, then you might find you pick up slightly at other times of the day and then, you know, kind of have these different dips and troughs in terms of your sleepiness and your energy. And if we're slicing up the day, I'm thinking about, well, how am I going to use this slice, given that often my energy is a bit lower at this time and so on. Or if there's other times in the day where you tend to have a little bit more in your tank, then you might make a different choice with that segment of the day. Knowing, of course, that it's never going to be perfect, it's going to change as well. So most people, if we pay close attention to it, can find that there tends to be, generally speaking, a bit of a pattern, but it's certainly not a perfect science by any stretch of the imagination. But if we're looking at for you, what are things that tend to be nurturing? What sort of tends to boost your energy even a little bit? And we might make a bit of an inventory of those things. So examples might be maybe certainly medication, caffeine, maybe engaging in something that you enjoy doing, engaging with someone who makes you feel liked, respected and appreciated. So we want to have this inventory and at times when my energy tends to dip, perhaps I'll make a choice to engage in one of these nurturing based activities. Similarly, if there's times when I've got a little bit in the tank, then this is when I might engage in activities that tend to deplete me a bit. So this might be housework or you know, something similar. Um, but again, we want that to be a realistic goal, right? So we're breaking down whatever that, that depleting activity. We want to be cautious not to boom and bust kind of get in there and do it all at once and then pay for it for hours or a day or so afterwards. And then, of course, there's going to be activities that are neither here nor there. They're kind of neutral from an energy perspective. So we can probably just put them wherever, really. But I guess this idea is we're sort of managing our day as efficiently as possible, you know, recognising and looking for some patterns, having a bit of inventory of things that boost us and things that tend to deplete us. I think an important overarching thing to consider here, though, is that even when you're doing the best you can in terms of managing your sleep and your daytime energy, there's going to be days that are much harder than others and that's not your fault. So, that, you know, there's times where your condition's a little bit easier to manage, times when it isn't. And so I guess what we want to do is have some self-compassion 
around that too. Behavioural activation is often something that we'll talk about as well. So if we think about this first sort of spiral there on the left, it does make sense if you're persistently sleepy and energy is low, that we're going to do less of the things that perhaps make us feel kind of a sense of reward and pleasure and social engagement. But that can lower our quality of life and lower mood, which will then further drain our energy. What we want to do, I guess, is try to shift a little bit as best we can towards that sort of right-hand spiral. And the intervention point is actually the, the sort of the purple and the, the blue circles there. What we want to do is sort of look at that balance of pleasant, social and rewarding activity in life, thinking about it from a Pomodoro technique, setting smart goals, all of those principles apply. But how, you know, am I including in my day things that um, are of, uh, you know, that increase my quality of life? The hope is that that helps us stabilise mood, which is going to be beneficial from an energy perspective. So I, look, I like to talk about the behavioural activation equation. So as a bit of a rule of thumb, ideally every day, trying to have at least one pleasant, one social and one rewarding activity in your day. If you do a little bit more than this, that's a nice bonus. But you know, have I tried to, in my day, incorporate these things? So socially, um, we'd be thinking realistically about where your baseline is at the moment. If you're quite socially isolated, maybe that looks like flicking someone a text message or connecting online and so on. But ideally with people with whom you feel liked, respected and appreciated. So kind of being guilted or yelled at by someone, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't count. Mastery. So maybe something you don't necessarily like to do, but feels good to have got it done. And pleasurable. So it might not achieve something, but it feels good to do it. Often if uh, mood is low, that will impact the amount of interest and pleasure that you'll derive from sort of these pleasurable activities. I guess the perspective I would take on that is two out of ten pleasure is better than zero out of 10 pleasure if you weren't to do it at all. And then ideally over time that, that builds. From a social perspective, something I wanted to talk to you about is sort of the pros and cons around disclosure and telling people about your condition. And I think absolutely this is an individual choice. There is absolutely pros and cons each perspective that you would take and you might be selective about who you do and don't disclose to. So you might not tell everyone but maybe, you know, particular people that are of, of benefit. So some of the advantages might be that it adds the potential for empathy and support from people around us. Perhaps the workplace can make some appropriate modifications for you to allow some strategic naps and so on. Potential disadvantages could be, you know, concern about stigma, for instance, or judgment. So I think there's something to kind of consider individually as to what that looks like, but this might be something that you find you sort of talk to a counsellor or a psychologist about as well, as well as, you know, people that you trust in your life. Okay, I guess some take-home messages again. Something I ask you to think about is, you know, if we think about energy as a precious and limited resource, how does that fluctuate in your day and how do you use it? You know, what are things that you choose to invest it in versus other things that you decide are of less relevance or value to you? You want to think about who you want to discuss and disclose your condition to. And... Often a uh, part of, you know, any counselling program would be maybe some assertiveness as well. You know, how do we set appropriate limits with, with others around us, both, you know, within our personal lives but maybe in the workplace as well or with education. What we want to do is increase nurturing activities if we can. So we want to put a few more of those pluses in the day 
if possible. And ideally that there's a balance, you know, there's going to be, you know, a lot of the activities of daily living, to be honest, are depleting, right? So we want to try and insert as many positives as we can. Uh, there's, it's very rare that I would see people who have got too many um, positives. <laughs> Most people are kind of pushing themselves pretty hard. There's lots of depleting and not many of the energy inserting activities. So that's something absolutely that we want to think about. Hyperarousal is something that I wanted to talk to you about because I guess we talk a lot about energy being low and being persistently sleepy. But another thing that we need to consider is perhaps when there's a wound up nervous system going on as well. So things like depression, uh, anxiety and stress will wind us up. But we're not designed to be wound up for a long period of time. We're meant to peak for brief periods of time in order to deal with a stressor. So that's sort of that fight, flight, freeze response. And then we come back down to our baseline. But if we're constantly a bit activated, that's really fatiguing for, from, for our nervous system. And it can lead us feeling fatigued in addition to sleepy. So that's something that I guess we can think about that, you know, we're managing our persistent sleepiness, but also is there an exhaustion element going on as well with things like persistent anxiety and stress? And what might we do to manage that? So from a nervous system standpoint, under our autonomic nervous system, that sympathetic branch is not designed to wind us up to deal with threat. The parasympathetic division winds us back down. This is where we restore energy. And ideally, sleep is a parasympathetic state. But also, you know, general relaxation strategies will help wind us down as well. So sometimes, again, it's about experimenting with what's helpful for you. If there's, if there's stress or anxiety in your life, what are self-care activities that you do to wind down, which is then going to, to have an energy benefit for you? You're going to recoup a little bit of that energy. All right. So self-care is a really important part of that coping. We're going to have that toolkit of nurturing and depleting activities. And ideally what we're doing is trying to set up, generally speaking, a long-term strategy that works for you. And that's going to be very individual to you compared to the next person. It's going to be different on different days. So you have to be kind of realistic and flexible within that. But ideally we've sort of got, generally speaking, a fairly consistent bedtime and wake time opportunities to nap if that's something that you find of use in your energy management toolkit as well as you know how do I generally structure the day. The cognitive element of CBT is around I guess looking at thinking and I, as a minimum ideally we want our thinking to serve us to be of use and be helpful to us. We certainly want to have a look at if there's any unhelpful ways of viewing ourselves or the world or our future that's um, you know, making us feel bad. So here's some examples of some helpful thinking prompts. But to be honest, the, the one that I think is I find most useful for most people is that what would I tell a friend in the same situation? That one, that one can be quite a, a fast sort of um, use. Because, you know, if, if I had a friend who has IH or a friend with uh, narcolepsy, what advice would I give them? I'm guessing it would be something useful but also compassionate. And how might we then apply that to ourselves? Mindfulness skills are something that can be part of this as well. So mindfulness can be useful. Some people don't like mindfulness and that's okay. Again, you can be flexible and try different stuff out. But mindfulness is useful both from a um, philosophical perspective as well as practically for many people. So the philosophy is very much around that present moment, acceptance, awareness, without judgment and non-striving. So kind of noticing, uh, another way to look at mindfulness is attention management. So what am I noticing in this moment? What's, what, what is my attention on? And I'm doing that non-judgmentally. 
sort of interest and um, non-judgment. And we can be mindful of anything. So whatever's, you know, I can put my attention to essentially is something I can be mindful of. So if I'm mindful of um, my level of sleepiness in this moment or um, fatigue in this moment, it means I've got the opportunity to then make a choice about how do I take care of myself. And similarly, I could be mindful of my environment, body sensations, thoughts, check whether there's some, um, you know, what thoughts are going on and perhaps sort of noticing and being able to let go if they're not serving me potentially. From a nervous system standpoint, mindfulness can be helpful too because a nice consequence of mindfulness can be winding down of your nervous system. So it often will sort of trigger that parasympathetic branch of that autonomic nervous system. So not necessarily the purpose of mindfulness, but a nice consequence of it is it might wind you down. So again, you want to be thinking about engaging in helpful thinking that serves you and is of use to coping, uh, learning to notice and let go or challenge unhelpful thinking. So cognitive restructuring is what we call it when we sort of change thinking. Mindfulness is a way of simply noticing and letting it go of that thinking. So sort of you can come at it from different angles. Mindfulness can be great for acceptance as well as calming that nervous system. I guess the, the last main thing that I wanted to talk to you about is sort of all the different aspects of life that are impacted by living with a central disorder of hypersomnolence. And what I hope is that you've got a care team around you of people that you trust, um, including you know, a sleep physician and GP, perhaps counselling or psychology if that's what you need. Maybe things like you know, physiotherapy or a dietitian to sort of optimise you know, your self-care and health as well as a supportive network of people around you and your social support network. And we want to think about are there any school or work modifications that might need to be made that would help us to function as best as we can in that environment, knowing that it's going to be an individual choice as to whether you actually disclose to work or uni or school that you have this condition. So it's sort of pros and cons. So I guess from a fair work perspective, you know, there's the opportunity for reasonable modifications around disclosure. Medications is a tricky one, and you know that's something that's been talked about a lot today as well. That it's you know the, it's often an experiment to find what's of of use to you, and then managing side effects associated with it. It's kind of very individual, and hopefully, uh, you know, again, you're engaged with a good GP and sleep physician to help you with managing that side of things. And driving. And, you know, if you, if you work in an environment where there's heavy machinery and, and so on. So, you know, there's lots of different things to consider and it's quite complex. And I guess my point there is, you know, what I hope is that you've got a supportive team around you that can help navigate that with you, but also make adjustments to it as well over time because it won't be static. So last take home messages. Ideally what we want to do is advocate for you in your work and in the different environments that you um, engage in. So uh, you know I will often work with people where they bring their partner along particularly if there's a lot of sort of brain fog and that sort of thing going on. It doesn't hurt to have you know someone else who's hearing the messages and helping to reinforce it. If, if you need your psychologist or your sleep physician to write a pointed letter to your workplace, very happy to do that for you. Um, but learning some assertiveness skills, if that's something that's sort of less your default, um, that, that can be something that is, you know, important with living with this condition. There are lots of strategies that, you know, the idea is to try and maximise your functioning as best we can with the reality of having a hypersomnolence condition, but knowing that that's going to fluctuate at times too and that that is not your fault. And having a good team around you. So that's, that's me done.